can you tell I'm having fun? <laughs> they say that at some point you become old enough that you should wear what you want to be even to your day job. <laughs> We've decided to pick up this topic of visualization, and we're going to pick it up for end users and for data scientists. But as we all know, we can also think of it as for muggles. Here we go. There we go. For muggles and wizards. I assume everybody here is a wizard, right? Do you work with muggles? Yeah, we, we everybody talks about citizen data scientists, and they talk about, you know, end users, and they talk, let's just talk about what they are. They're muggles. <laughs> and when you pick up these topics, it's really interesting. And we decided to pick up this topic of visualization. You see, because when you talk to a muggle, they know that it's not magic. They know that it's something really, really, really complicated. And when I ask people to describe it to me, this is, this is sort of what comes out of their mouth. But we all know that's not true. Now, we're at the NIME conference, so everybody knows how this works. Everybody knows that it's actually a process that starts and we go through a sequence of steps, and it doesn't matter what the problem is. And what you've seen earlier today from Christian and the team is an example of how you can use guided analytics to do things like this. And did you enjoy that? Was it good? And it really is very practical. But it got us thinking, you know, if you take a look at this whole topic of guided analytics, you can understand what's going on, uh, particularly for the more complex thing, machine learning and preparation and, and the automation of a lot of those tasks. But I got thinking to myself, can guided analytics actually help us for some of those day-to-day -day tasks? And that's why we decided to focus in on this topic here of visualization. So let's take a look at how this looks. Now, we're going to start with a very basic example, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll admit I need a lot of help to do these presentations. So we're going to first focus on the muggles and actually doing basic visualization. I need to make a graph for a presentation. And I'd like to ask my, some of my team to come out. Marit, can you come out, please? It's, it's time for you to come on stage. <laughs> Hi, Phil. You look really good, I got to admit. <laughs> um, and now, um, Marit is from Finland, and I've done a lot of work in Finland, and I know that in Finland they have trolls. Uh, do you have uh, wizards as well? At least one very special. That's you? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So Marit and I worked on this topic, and we thought we'd walk through a basic example. Now, for the advanced uh, Nimers here, you're going to say, okay, okay, okay. But for those of you that are kind of new to Nime in the topic, just let's think through some of this. Now, when we talk about visualization, what are we looking at? Well, in the old days, well, in the really old days, when I was young, we didn't have graphics, but okay, that's another story. Um, uh, what used to happen is this. You would have some data, you'd have a tool, you would go through, you would pick a graph, you'd hook it all together. You had to figure out, was the data right? You had to do all of these things. Did you get the right type? Did you have your domains right? Was the data good? There was all of these things that could go wrong, and we all know how we learned. We learned by doing. And a lot of us have done this, and you've got to remember there's still a lot of people out there in the world that don't know how to do this. So what's happened over the last year or two in this area? Well, the BI vendors, the business intelligence vendors, and they've done some fantastic things. I'm not knocking what they're doing. They've actually tried to go through and automate this a little bit. You can see they've come up with interactive applications. They've gone through and they've said, OK, if you choose your data, I'll sort of tell you what graph to use. And we'll do um, sort of appropriate things so you can move very, very quickly. But there's still some problems with that. In all of these, there's still the assumption that the data is clean and perfect, and that the data you've pointed to is actually what you want. 
it's also a little bit of a black box. So although it's magic and it happens very quickly and efficiently, it is a black box and it's faster, but it's really hard to do multiples at the same time. So I sat down with Marit and we said, okay, now can we use guided analytics to actually do something better? And of course she said, yes. Let's start. We're going to show an example, right? I think that's a good idea. Okay. What should I do first? So you know your data, mm -hmm. and you know what you want to have at the end. A nice okay. graph. A nice graph, correct. But you say you're not happy with the waiter. Well, I'm not quite sure that when I, when I go through and choose the data, I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. I think I can help you. Okay. Let me show you something. Okay. So here we go. What do I do? Oh, data. So First, select some data. Okay. Um, I'm going to choose the airlines data because I've worked with the analyst community for far too long, and this is the only data set they know. <laughs> if you ever <laughs> say airline, they go, oh, well, it's airline, yeah. So I'm going to choose airline because it's one that everybody knows. So I've chosen my airline, and um, I click. Oh, okay, columns of data. Well, that doesn't look really exciting. I mean, what's, what have you done? Anything? So here you see all the columns mm -hmm. in the airline data set and the data types. Correct. But take a look. There are some numeric columns yeah. that I have converted the string for you. For example, the day of week. Oh. Because it only had a few unique mm -hmm. values in it. Okay. And all the columns with constant values, I removed them. So you've actually reduced some data, you've transformed the data, you've done all of that with, with automation and guided analytics exactly. behind the scenes. Okay, one of the reasons we did this example was because it shows you lots of the basics of how to pick things up and actually transform them. So this is a really good example to learn. But I'm going to go through and um, uh, need to choose some things. Okay, let me choose Lumos. Lumos. And Lumos. Okay, I've tried. These work a lot better than the clicker, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've chosen three. Okay, I, I see over here you've got my three, three choices. Um, okay, t tell me what I've got here. Now take a look at your selection. You okay. selected two numeric columns uh -huh. and one string columns. Are you uh, happy with no, the data types? That, that, that string column isn't a string, it's a date. I agree. So maybe we want to... Do something for you. Okay. Check the box there Check above. Check the box. Lumos. <laughs> okay, and what am I seeing here? So here you see the three columns you selected. Uh -huh. The data types and the first value in each column. Mm -hmm. I think the first two ones, they look good. Okay, they yep, they're okay. I don't need to do anything there. But the third one, it's string. Okay. And I think we want to convert it to date and time. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. And what do I do now? So here you see, you have to provide the date format. Mm -hmm. Tell where in the string are the years, months, and dates. Uh, and if I don't understand what a date format is, what do I do? Then I have here some help for you, the oh, description. Okay. okay, I can type that in and I can do this and I, I click on go. Oh, I got a graph, cool. Yes, this is line plot. Okay. One of the most meaningful ways of visualizing time series. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this, this is, a, this is a basic plot, but I mean, I can't send something to my boss which says his title or doesn't have anything on it. I, I, I need to sort of make this special for my boss. Uh, how do I do that? This line plot is an interactive view, so you can customize it. Just click the icon okay. in the top right corner. And I can go, oh, okay. So I can change my chart, my title, I can add all of my things. Um, I don't actually need all the information here, so can I, can I somehow reduce it? Yes, you can zoom it. Just scroll on the view. Okay, and then I can scroll and I... Oh, good. That's exactly what I want. Okay. Now, um, I, I've got it on my screen, but that's not good enough for me. I, I, I need it in my PowerPoint presentation. So what do I need to do? Just continue. Okay. And now, you see, there is a view mm -hmm. you customized mm -hmm. as a downloadable image. Okay. So I can download it, and at the end... I have my graph. There it is. Okay. Now you can put it into your presentation. Now, I worked with Marit on this. She has so much behind this that is really, really cool. For tonight, we decided to start with the simplest example possible and just have um, one graph chosen because that was the choice. But there's a lot behind this. And I think what we want to do is just spend a minute or two looking at this workflow and it's probably one of the easier workflows for guided analytics that you will have seen. Marit, can you explain it a bit? So here you see, we went through several steps. 
uploading the data, selecting columns, mm -hmm. converting the data types if necessary, mm -hmm. customizing the view, mm -hmm. and downloading the image. Okay. And here you can see all these steps. Okay, now I know that you've got an awful lot in here and the examples are available, so you can actually drill down. But what I asked Marit was, if you wanted to show, because the, these are nine people, these are wizards, they want to see the magic. So if we, you were going to choose two spots to show and drill down a little bit to just show one or two techniques, right? I think, let's first take a look at converting the domains. Okay. What happens there? So here you see a try-catch enclosure. Okay. Try catch enclosure, tries to execute a node, and if the execution fails, it provides an alternative output. In this case, I asked the user for something, and it was the date format. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a risk that something goes wrong. And in such case, this try catch enclosure takes care of it. If the conversion of the column type fails, then it provides the original type of the column mm -hmm. as an alternative output. What I like about this is um, I, 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 when I learned about try-catch, I used to think, oh, it was just for taking care of data situations or when, when a node wasn't going right. But if you think of it, this is how you can muggle-proof your application. As a matter of fact, we actually thought of something a little too late, but you know where we were manually typing in the dates? We could have run that through a try-catch, tried a whole bunch of different things, found the one that automatically worked and done it that way as well. But for this example, we've kept it really simple because I love this if you're learning how to muggle-proof an application. Maybe we take a look at where the views okay, where the graphs are generated. Yeah, because you showed me one graph, but I, I know there's more. Oh, my yeah. God. Oh my god, it looks complicated. No, it's not complicated. You remember, you could have selected one, two, or three columns mm -hmm. of type numeric, string, or date and time. Mm -hmm. And here, there are all the possible combinations of these. So, one of these mm -hmm. is activated, one of these nested wrapped metanodes is activated, depending on your selection. So basically, you figured out all the logic and if I wanted to, I could go and pop in more graphs if I wanted. Exactly. So the logic is now there, and you can use it for any data set. This is, why, this is why I like working with people like Marit, because when she writes it, I can steal it and use it, and I don't need to figure it out, and so can you. And that's what's so cool about this. But, you know, I'm a graphics guy. I'm old. I want to see pictures. Um, I know this doesn't just do one graph at a time. It does as many as possible. So should we show them a few examples? I think that's a good idea. Okay. So if you select one column, mm -hmm. you could get one or more of these options. And it's automatically determined based on what the one column was. Exactly. And the two? two? columns. Mm -hmm. These or okay. some of the other options. Lots more examples. Three? Columns. These or some of the others. Available. Okay, now for those that don't know Nime very well, did you hand code all of these different graphs and things, or where, where, did, where did the supply of graphs come from? These are JavaScript. They're just JavaScript, JavaScript. nodes, right? Yeah. So but you're basically you, using them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there is your favorite graph missing, I mm -hmm. think there is something you would like to add there. The logic is there, mm -hmm. and it's easy to add more graphs. Okay. Now the logic is there, modifying the consequence, it's easy. Okay. I like this example because it's, it's probably the tightest example. It has no, it, it's got a lot of pre-processing in it. It's using machine learning to do a lot of tricky things, but it's not focused on a machine learning problem. It's focused on totally automating the process, which means you can use it for things like um, uh, going to an Excel spreadsheet. But more importantly, it's a component, which means you can actually include it in any other guided analytics application you've put together. And Marit's made sure that it's, it's pretty robust. She has muggle-proofed it as much as she could. And um, I'd like to thank you, because I think that's a good example for those of you that would like to learn a little more. Thank you, Marit. Thank you. Now, what, we, what we've done here is we've actually completed that column over on the right. You'll be able to get all the slides later, including the examples, and take a look. But we've actually nailed that topic pretty well. And as I said, we're using the power of analytics in ways that a lot of the BI tools can't. Next, we've got a topic. And of course, we've talked about muggles, but I want to now talk about wizards.
we're all wizards. And you see examples like this, and you think to yourself, yeah, 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 Phil, that's cool. I can go off and I can use that for my muggles and my end users. They'll really like it. But there's nothing in it for me. Au contraire. It is really, really also for you. And to help me with that, I'd like to have Paolo come out on stage. Paolo, come on out. Hey, everyone. Now, you, I, I've got I've to tell you, I don't like him on stage because he looks good. <laughs> what are we talking about? Well, Paolo, this is the challenge that I gave him. How many of you sometimes get hundreds of columns of data, thousands of columns of data? You're supposed to do something with it, and you have no clue what's in the data. Has that ever happened to you? Hands out, yeah, yeah. And so what do we do? We start working through. We look at it, we start doing some comparisons, we maybe run some box plots, we play with it, we slice, we dice, we say, oh God, that's not good. And we spend tons and tons of time just trying to understand the data and get rid of the rubbish. So I went to Paolo and said, okay, Paolo, you think this guided analytics stuff is good. What I want you to do is build something that will help every person in this audience do their job as a wizard. Paolo, All right. over um, to you. So let's start. Uh, yes, so this is the workflow uh, I want to show you. The, first, the second part, this is the part of uh, Mari. Now, on top of it, we have a new part here. This is to automatically find what we want to visualize. So we are going to run in this metanode lots of statistical tests that automatically detect a column that is interesting to visualize. And then we have this rapid metanode here, guided exploration, which automatically creates a dashboard with the best visualization we found. So, of course, you can open this in the analytics platform, right? Paolo, and just can, you, can you make that bigger, please? I, I, my eyes are okay. bad. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> Fine. So, the point is that we have this univariate column detection here. And we are going to visualize all those different columns automatically. We found the distribution that is most uniform, the one that is most skewed, and, and so on. The, the, the one that has a bin that is much bigger than the others, or a box plot with many, many uh, outliers. So all of this is detected automatically, and you can scroll this through this dashboard to have a first look at your data. The second part is on the multivariate uh, column detection. This is just simple correlation, right? We have a, a two scatter plot. One is showing the stronger inverse correlation, and the other one the stronger uh, linear cor uh, direct correlation, right? But this is between numerical columns. What do you do when you want to find relationship between categorical and numerical columns, uh, or ju only just between the categorical? So uh, this is the sunburst, and, and we can see here different relationship, with the, the stronger relationship between two categorical columns. Okay, now wait a minute. I mean, these are all pretty pictures, but I want interactive. I mean, I want to be able to click. I want to be able to do things. Can you do that? Yeah, use the one. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So we can definitely uh, use the row filter here, and by moving it, we can filter the data and see the visualization, how it changed with the, the different amount of data, then we can uh, interact with it. For example, this is their lane data set, right? So we are going to select here all the flights departing from Chicago Air Airport, and we find that the majority comes from United Airlines, because that airport is a big app for United. So basically, we, we can interact with those uh, workflows and understand cert certain things. Um, yeah, so let's move to the next part. This is about uh, combining categorical and, and numerical uh, columns to find strong relationship. We, we did an ANOVA test here to find uh, uh, this conditional box plot, and we find that there is, of course, a relationship between the numerical departure delay and the, uh, the categorical class uh, delay or no delay. Or, for example, we have the same thing by stacking two histograms. 
Um, and, and all of this is automatically computed. Again, you don't need to do anything except su supplying the data. And then also more uh, here relationship with a parallel coordinate plot. For example, here we have this uh, uh, missing value coordinate plot. Uh, basically, whenever the flight is diverted, we find that those two other columns have all missing values. And that's a relationship that the dashboard finds yeah. automatically. Now, what's interesting about this is you can tell Paolo not only has a sense of style, he actually knows how to do a lot of this stuff. We don't have enough time today to go through all of the different combinations that are automatically in this dashboard, but they're all there. Um, I'm, uh, he's invented a couple of relatively new ones. Where's Dean? Dean, um, I want you to take a look at this later and tell us whether it's sensible, because you may have one or two ideas of things we should be adding in here. But that's the whole point of this, coming up with a blueprint that works immediately that you can actually use. All right. Um, so to sum up the end of the dashboard, we have this bar chart. And this is basically measuring the quality of the feature. Here is always constant, so that's why the, the, this bar chart gives the bad quality rank the highest to here. And, and so you can see right away, maybe uh, scrolling through all those different columns when there is something weird going on with certain columns. OK, Paolo, I, I'm an old guy. The graphs and everything are really cool, but I actually want to look at the data too. So okay, can you find here? This, this is called the fill table. <laughs> The field table is made to inspect actual a column and see the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, skewness, and so on. And mm -hmm. also, you can visualize the distribution. Okay. And yeah, so basically, the last part we want to do is to maybe we've seen something interesting in the data, and we want then to highlight certain columns, right? So since everything is interactive, we can use this bar chart to select all the columns that we want to do something with, that we want to export from the rapid meta node, right? So we are going to go ahead and select, for example, all the delay columns, which are all components of the delay that we do not want to visualize, or to keep for the rest of the workflow, right? Okay. So we can apply here. There is the apply and close, and, and then this will be exported from the rapid meta node. And in this column here, uh, the, the column filter, the reference column filter, will for us uh, remove those columns for the table. But that's up to you what you want to do with the flood columns, right? OK, well, no, I like it. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're automatically identifying everything that's sort of interesting. And I can flag it. Uh, but the way I look at this is that when we go through, we actually um, want to do something else. I don't know about you, but for the, maybe for the airline data set, you only have to go through once. But how many of you say, right, I've dropped the 10 variables. Now let's look at it again. And what I like to say, this is one of my favorite pictures. I think of it as peeling a damned big onion. Yeah, This is the biggest onion in the world, and that's my data. And I've basically, I've stripped off the outside layer. But I, I don't know yet whether I'm finished. Um, I, I like onions. Uh, we should have used a lasagna, I think. Would <laughs> lasagna would have been better. <laughs> but you get the idea. So, so, Paolo, tell me. I mean, that's really cool, but I, I want to be able to keep using it for okay. my onion. How so do I what, do that? What we have seen before, it's using the dashboard for the first layer of the onion. We can reuse it again for the second layer of the onion and keep going. And what we do to do this is basically uh, using an application. This time, we're going to run it on the Nine web portal. So we go on the Nine server. Then we open this workflow here that is called Guide Exploration. And here, we actually have uh, the two recursive loop start nodes. This will make us repeat this view over and over again. And, and as you can see here in the red rectangle, you have the same exact nodes that we were seeing before. We just nested them in this recursive loop. So the way it will work that we can then open this workflow in the web portal, and here we have it. We select the data in the beginning, and then next, we have this dashboard. And as you can see, we have, OK, sure, that's really interesting. Day of month is really uniform, right? But maybe you want to see something that is not that obvious in the next iteration. So you go in the bottom, and as we said before, we remove all of those columns. And one of two of those are the two columns I was just showing you before. So once you remove them and you hit next, the next page will have, instead of those two, two other columns that maybe are more interesting to you, right? So you keep going and you keep finding new things. All right. So what you do next is then remove another column, and then that's it. 
And I, I really like this. Now, the, the thing that's, that's interesting for me here is, once again, there is some fantastic example code in here, example workflows, meta nodes, wrapped meta nodes that you're going to be able to use. But what I asked Paolo to do was pick something that he wanted to show you, sort of his favorite tip or his favorite slide. What'd you choose? Uh, yeah, so basically we we can have a look at it. It's much easier also because I knowing them all by memory. Yeah, let's open the wrapper meta node. So we can go here and then that's actually executing on the server and then we open the uh, meta node and we can actually see the, the nodes they were shown before. And as you can see, it's nothing that complicated. We just have a list of JavaScript nodes and in some cases is a nested wrapper meta node, which is uh, basically we, we are just pre-processing the data bit. So we can, uh, you can download this workflow and you can actually add more nodes to this or remove the ones you do not like. And uh, the system will, uh, uh, will work and, and you can customize it. Basically. Yeah. So, so basically, we're not only modifying the workflow, we're also mod automatically, auto uh, auto or automatically changing the dashboard as well. Mm -hmm. A little smaller, a little more, my favorite technique, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Also, I don't know, the logo of the company on the top, whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, two, oh. well, there we go. There we go. Fewer lights, no coding at all. We just use the Nime to do this entire visual analytics tool, guide analytics tool, guided exploration. It's a web application that was done without coding, and it's all. Uh, automated uh, on a server. Then we have the, the useful thing about nest rapid meta nodes, that it's a new thing that you can do when you want to have more complex views. And yeah, the, the basic concept is that in the first iteration, you have obvious anomalies in relationship. And after some iteration, you have a strong and unexpected partners, uh, patterns, right? So this is, uh, you should give it a try and see what happens as you interact with it. Uh, you can customize it, and you can also customize not just the dashboard, also the loop. You can add another wrapper meta node if you want to do another operation after selecting the columns, right? And, and so on. So I think that's it for me. I think that's fantastic. And we made sure that this little list of tips and tricks was there. So afterwards, when you get the slides yourself, you'll have an idea of what you should go back and look for when you're looking at the example. Was that cool? Could you use it? Thank you, Paolo. OK, so what I want to do now is do a little bit of a summary. And I'm sure that most of you are tired of hearing me. We actually had a team of four working on this. And behind the scenes, I had one more wizard helping me. And I'd like to ask Scott to come out on. And what Scott's going to do is he's going to give us a bit of a Scott, I would have you know that that is not an approved professor's outfit for Hogwarts. Yeah. Um, I have a little problem with it. Uh, why, pray tell? Well, I'm actually from the Texas A&M Wizarding School. I'm an American, so we just do things a little differently, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic. So they have wizards in Texas, too? Apparently. <laughs> a few. Here and there. <laughs> OK. What I asked Scott to do was give us a little summary of some of the things. There's some lovely tips and tricks. I learned so much by doing this. That's why I love working with these people. Um, Scott, take it over. Tell us a little bit about what we've been seeing. Yeah, so we wanted to just talk a little bit about the magic behind the scenes and some of the design decisions that were made in pulling these two workflows together uh, by Mart and Paolo. So you probably already familiar, familiar as Nime users and wizards with our existing guided analytics use case examples, which are already on the example server, things that, uh, you know, we have use cases for inventory analysis, benchmarking, uh, the teacher bots that Vincenzo and Rosaria talked about last year. These are all pretty specific use case examples, right? But what we're talking about today, we call the guided analytics blueprints, and these are really complete extendable applications. So the idea here is that you're going to have these workflows. You can take and use the entire thing if you want to, or just bits and pieces that may apply to whatever it is you're doing, and really make it your own. So we have, we've already heard uh, about the machine learning automation earlier with Christian and Paolo, and then just now, the exploration and visualization blueprints that we have. So what's in common among all, all of these blueprints? It turns out that some of the magic that's happening is, is by design, 
Um, and there's some consistency. So there's consistency in several ways, um, not only with how the different nodes are laid out on the canvas, how uh, different aspects of the workflows are documented, just the style of how things are presented, and also the, the way that they actually work. Um, I should mention that everything that you've seen so far is going to come with data for you to be able to use and play with and adapt. Uh, these work on NIME Analytics platform, just on your local machine, but where they really shine is when you use them with the NIME web portal available via the NIME server. So I mentioned the consistent look and feel. What are some of the magic things that we did to get that consistent look and feel? Greg talked about some of these earlier today, if you were in his session. So we have this new layout panel for arranging elements, right? Maybe we have three different plots that we want to put on a particular, or in a particular combined view, along with some explanatory text, um, maybe a table somewhere. We can arrange all of these different aspects of our visualization simply by dragging and dropping using the layout panel. And so from, as we go from view to view, from meta node to meta node within a single workflow, or even within different workflows, we can have this nice, consistent look and feel. Something else we did was we used the CSS editor. Uh, we passed CSS classes that we specify in our very first initial wrapped meta node to identify things like what fonts I want to use, what size should it be, should it apply to titles or you know, whatever, and have that internal consistency so that all we have to do in subsequent uh, nodes downstream is just reference the CSS we've already defined. Uh, you may have seen, too, that we have, via JavaScript and HTML, we have this header uh, that is at the top of the web portal when you execute the workflow. And this gives the end user an idea of kind of where they're at in the process. It's kind of a generalized version of the workflow. Uh, so this is all prepared with this JavaScript. And we do something else with the HTML that we're passing via flow variables, is we dynamically populate this little sidebar guide. And this is worth highlighting here. Um, you may have noticed in some of uh, Mart's workflow, maybe you have a, you know, a line plot moving average and a line plot cumulative sum that's going to show up on a particular JavaScript view that you've developed. And so dynamically, according to whatever plot types are on the page, we can actually have information displayed particular to those plots for the user so that they understand what it is that they're looking at. And, and I got to add, this I think is fantastic because one of the things that I always got bothered about is how do I keep the documentation going with the dynamic decisions going on, the automated decisions going on behind the scenes. And this is fantastic. It's a wonderful technique that the guys came up with for basically saying when we've made a, uh, a decision, we can also make the same decision for what text is shown over there on the right. It's a lovely, lovely trick, and I, I really recommend it taking a look at it. It's, it's beautiful. So when we're talking about features in common, the point we really want to hammer home is this idea of reusability. Um, you know, take bits and pieces or the whole thing, whatever it is you need, and reuse within your workflows. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, right? If it's something that we've done or something you've already done yourself, don't start from scratch. Reuse those meta nodes. Now, one of the decisions that we made uh, in putting these together uh, we use wrapped meta nodes whenever there's an interaction point with the user, right? So we need the user to choose a particular file to upload or select particular columns they want to visualize, whatever it is. We're saying, OK, that's going to be within a wrapped meta node. That's how we're going to pull that information from the user to continue. Now, we use regular meta nodes a lot, too, which you probably saw. We're using those to do things like uh, specific branching or logic within the workflow, if there's some looping and automation that we need to do, or even just tidying things up from a workflow design perspective, we would use these regular meta nodes. And one of the nice little bits of magic is that you can nest these meta nodes within each other. So you see an example here of the pre-processing node. That's at a very top level. Within it, there's a separate meta node that contains this detect visualizations uh, functionality. And even within that meta node, at a third level, we have additional meta nodes to activate the numerical and categorical analyses. And you can keep going on if you want to. Um, the other nice thing about using meta nodes for this case is it's a little bit easier to get the flow variables out. One other point to point here. This is a great example. I think these, these Marit, you use these, I think, don't you, in her example. They actually came from the guided machine learning one. So we're actually not just packaging it. We're actually reusing these sub-nodes sub as well, which is fantastic. 
So a little bit on what we learned in pulling all of this together. Um, a key point, which I'll touch on again in a second, but modularizing with meta nodes from the very beginning, starting the design process from a very high level, not with the individual tasks that you want to do, but rather, you know, what am I trying to do overall? Uh, something else that we didn't do, but you should do, is use the meta node template repository so that you can document your meta nodes. Um, you know, if there's any versioning changes that are happening, you can keep track of that, and it really makes things simple in terms of reuse. We didn't do this only because we're putting these workflows on the example server. We want you to all use them, but if you're using them on uh, your own server, then definitely use the meta node template repository. Uh, this one seems kind of obvious, but I think is worth hitting on to think before you build your workflow. Because people are going to do really strange and unexpected and odd things that you weren't anticipating. So there's a commonality here, right? The more user interaction you have, the more complexity you're going to have. If you give someone a lot more choices, then they have the opportunity to go off track and do all sorts of weird stuff that you then have to build logic to try and corral. And that's going to take more time. You know, on the other hand, if you give people fewer choices, then that's less unknown behavior you have to deal with, less logic you have to build in, saves you time. So if you think before you build, and you focus on just what is absolutely necessary, you can still come up, even with minimal interaction, with these really good-looking interactive applications that Marit and Paolo showed you. So uh, last point here, when we're talking about modularization and you know, at the very beginning, starting the design process, how do we want to think about this? So, if you mock up your workflow first with these kind of empty meta nodes and wrap meta nodes to represent automation and interaction in your application, things will really go a lot smoother for you. If the wizard over there will plug his ears for just a moment, okay. uh, I don't want him to get the big head. Some of us at NIME call this fill style. Right? So we have these, uh, you'll see the web page and interaction up at the top here uh, where you're, you know ahead of time. I have you know, a particular point where I'm going to need the user to tell me something. I need to get some information from him. Uh, and then down at the bottom, I've got the automation and control logic where I need to do some branching or looping or whatever. If I can identify these first going in and think in general terms of the tasks I wanted to do, then I can go fill in these meta nodes later with the actual nodes that I'm going to use to perform my tasks. Can I take my fingers out yet? I guess. OK. All right. Thank you very much. So where can you guys get all this stuff? Uh, all of these, we have three workflows. So we have just the guided visualization, just the guided exploration, and then the combined version. These are all up on the newly unveiled workflow hub. Mm -hmm. So please check them out. We're excited to see what you guys are going to do with them. And to wrap up, I'd like to get, the, get Paolo and, um, and Marit back up here on stage because we would like to thank a lot of people at Nine. Behind the scenes, there's only four of us up here, but there's people that behind the scenes that really helped us do this. As always, we're pushing the edge on some of these things, trying to come up with some. And f uh, on behalf of all of us, so for all of the Nimers, thank you very much for helping us. And it only remains for me to say just one or two things. This actually got us thinking. We started thinking of other applications we should do. Should we do data blending? Should we do, there's lots and lots and lots of things we could do to extend this. We'd like us uh, for you to talk to us, but most importantly, I'd like you to try it yourself. Please do so. Thank you very much. We're going to be around for questions afterwards up by the drinks. I don't know about you, but I need a beer. Have a good evening.